Hi, I'm Kanu and I want to talk about peritoneal pockets in endometriosis today. I've divided this video into two cases just to showcase how they look to begin with. Now, this is a case, a case of a young lady who has already had urethrolysis, as you can see over here. And post uh, the pelvic sidewall excision on the left side, you will see how we have discovered uh, this retraction pocket. Now, these are also called Allen Masters pocket, which typically re refer to a peritoneal defect or a retraction pocket that is seen on the posterior broad ligament or lateral pelvic sidewall, often in patients with endometriosis. Now, it's named after Allen and Masters who described this in the context of uterine retroversion and pelvic pain way back in 1950s before the pathophysiology of endometriosis was fully understood. So this is exactly where the fold of the pocket or the retraction pocket lies. As you can see, initially we thought it was just a small thing, but as you can see, the minute you start opening up, it's a deep recess, which goes quite deep inside. People who do these kinds of excision will often find that these pockets run quite deep. So it's really important to know the anatomy and the bearings around it. So what is this pocket? It's a defect or a depression often seen in the right or left pelvic sidewall, sometimes just behind the uterosacral ligament as seen over here, lateral to the uterine body. Now this is associated with traction, scarring or tethering due to deep infiltrating endometriosis. And often I find these symptoms would be, I feel like there's a tight band over here doctor that's just pulling especially when I move all of these are actually symptoms of deep endometriosis or these uh, retraction pockets it appears like a deep fold a groove even or sometimes a pocket which is often tented and retracted that may hide endometriotic lesions so you will see over here as the case progresses we try to avert this peritoneal pocket and you will see endometriotic lesions on the surface of the peritoneal lining now this is usually caused by fibrosis, scarring, and traction from the deep endometriotic nodules. It frequently results at times in invasive disease of the parametrium, uterosacral, and the rectovaginal septum as seen in this um, video as well. Now it may appear empty, but on surgical exploration, you can actually see the occult lesions, the small implants, or even at times infiltrating nodules. So over here, you will see that we have gone ahead and dissected the rectum out uh, and we're lifting it up because I want to see where is the base of this um, retraction pocket where does this end it's almost like a cone where the deep part of the end of the cone uh, can be a bit difficult to get to so it's really important to completely identify and excise it the peritoneum appears sunken puckered or distorted sometimes it can be ex mistaken for a normal variant unless you carefully explore it even in this case if you hadn't looked for it uh, hadn't actually gone ahead and seen deep inside, it would have just been like a fold cost due to the manipulator or something. So it's really important uh, because it can be mistaken for a normal variant unless it's carefully explored. Uh, like we've spoken, it's associated sometimes with tethering of the ovary, the tube, scarring of the uterosacral ligament or nodularity around the ureter. So this should be carefully dissected uh, because uh, if not, leaving them behind can lead to persistent pain or recurrence. Uh, try to use sharp dissection to unroof and explore. And you can consider ureterolysis and ICG dye for safety and margin clarity, especially if it's close to the ureter. Often the histopathology confirms deep infiltrating endometriosis. Even if, you know, the superficial appearance when you have a first initial look looks fairly benign and there's nothing to it. So really what you have to do, as you can see over here, we're trying to de-roof it, go 
delineate all the borders in and around it so have a look at the anterior the posterior both the sides and when you finally get to the bottom of it that's when you go ahead and excise so what are the sides i know on the left side there's the ureter and i've already done a ureterolysis to begin with as you'd seen initially in the video we had excised the pelvic sidewall peritoneum as well as it seemed to be mildly uh, deceased and after that we go ahead as you can see the rectum over there is delineated we go ahead and delineate exactly where are the borders where does the fibers uh, stretch up to and once that's done um, i've decided um, over here to actually introduce a rectal probe because i wanted a bit more of a clarity as to where exactly are these fibers so you can see my assistant doing a really good job she's inserting the rectal probe and we want to see the lateral edges of the rectum because all said and done we may feel oh we're quite far away but the lateral fibers of the rectum may creep into this deep medially extending nodules so now you can get a good extent of you know how exactly this nodule is or how deep this pocket is you can see inside these pockets as well very clearly there are definitely endometriotic uh, spots or nodules and there is a pocket inside the pocket over here as well so once that's done i've decided let me go higher up uh, because i want to actually completely open up the pararectal space from a bit higher up um, get a good plane where it's healthy where the tissue is not affected and then go down to the abnormal so normal to abnormal kind of helps you when at times um, you're in despair and you really don't know which way to go ahead with so once this is done i feel confident that i have pushed the rectum completely to the other side and then i can go Go ahead and boldly coagulate the uh, or excise the entire peritoneal pocket sometimes um, when there is a bit of um, uh, visceral uh, adiposity it can be a bit hard especially we know that the uh, visceral adipose tissue it's a lot of blood supply so one has to be really careful to secure all of that uh, if not the surgical feel becomes a bit uh, bloody and you may not be able to see the entire borders of your pocket so at this point i'm just having a look seeing how deep it is and seeing uh, where exactly do i need to make that cut and um, you will see again the rectal probe helping me i can see that all right the most of the rectum is over there and um, that traction it's all about traction and counter traction isn't it that traction actually helps me to um, make some more clearer cuts so I want to get all the peritoneum uh, that's puckered uh, deep inside as well. So at times it may come in two halves or uh, sometimes you may be able to take it out as a whole as an end block so let's see what happens over here i think uh, initially i thought that uh, this is it but then i can see that uh, there's a bit more so i get my fourth arm try to grasp that bit that's left behind as well because all of that also contains the peritoneum and i'm trying to um, thin it down trying to delineate to see exactly which bit of it that i need to excise so over here i've gone well below uh, the peritoneal pocket there's a nice juicy artery just over there so so one has to be really careful to stay above it so that you don't poke right into it. Um, I suppose that would be the middle rectal artery. And uh, now we are completely uh, confident to excise it. And you can see the ureter nicely vermiculating on the other side. So that's good. I usually don't put um, extra assistant ports. I use my uh, robot ports itself to take the specimens out. So this is the way we do it. And once that's done, uh, I thought that the uterosacral as well on the left side was a bit thickened uh, where we have gone ahead and excise all of that as well that becomes really easy now because you have dissected the rectum you have delineated the pararectal space you have um, moved or lateralized the ureter so all that's left is the thickened uterosacral ligament and we have gone ahead and excised that This seems a bit easy to do uh, now that all the dissection is complete, but uh, really important to excise all of this. Um, if not, there is a chance of um, residual pain. All right, so that's done. We did go ahead and excise a whole lot of endo after this as well, uh, but I'm not going to cover all of that because uh, I really want to concentrate on peritoneal pockets in this video. 
So again, using the same port to retrieve the specimen. And once that's done, we go ahead with the excision of the remainder of the endometriosis. There's just one last slide I've included over here. I want to see what the final look of this um, excision looks like, uh, post-excision, uh, sorry. So over here, you can see that the rectum is now being mobilized. You can see that our area of dissection was far away, so we're pretty safe. We did a, um, you know, water test as well, where we use a bit of air into the rectum through a syringe, a Tumi syringe, and hope for the best. So over here, this is case number two. And again, overall looks okay. This is a lady who has adenomyosis of the uterus and uh, a bit of uh, pelvic pain as well. And previous two cesareans, as you can see, there are some adhesions uh, right in front as well. So, and a really tiny fibroid. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about that fibroid. It's quite small and it's subserial as well. I don't think it's causing a lot of issues. But this over here uh, is the ICG that we've used to delineate the ureter, which um, to be honest, for me, reduces the cognitive overload. So I really like like to use it. Uh, I don't want um, my you know, CPU brain to be running at full capacity always. I'd like to just concentrate on the main things that needs to be done. And if I can use anything that can reduce the cognitive load like ICG, uh, then yes, so be it. Uh, so here we have gone ahead and we've used the endometriotic approach to go ahead and dissect the ureter. And in this method, uh, if you do use and this sort of, uh, sort of peeling um, method is what I call it. Uh, most of the times you can preserve the nerves as well because really you're not um, cutting through rashly uh, tissues. You're actually doing a gentle dissection and pushing or uh, peeling away the tissues that are attached to the peritoneum or the posterior broad ligament, which um, then preserves all the arteries and uh, nerves that benefit the patient. So most of the ureter is now pushed laterally so we're just going ahead and opening that space a bit more uh, flying right above the ureter so that uh, we can get a bit more space to cut that peritoneum once you do these releasing incisions um, you will see that the peritoneum opens up as well and um, that tight band like feeling that the patient probably experiences uh, will get a bit of relief because no longer are there tight fibrotic bands holding all of this tissue together. And uh, that's the main reason why we advocate for excision of the uh, pelvic sidewall, even if there is just superficial endometriosis. And definitely so if you see these peritoneal pockets. So once this um, releasing incision is done, I think the urethrolysis over here is fairly complete. So we're happy with that. And uh, we go ahead and excise that um, sidewall as well. So you will see that being done now. I do like to use the fenestrated bipolar. Uh, I am dabbling with um, the Maryland bipolar as well. Maryland is excellent for uh, opening up the tissues, especially with endometriosis. But uh, if I couple a hysterectomy onto that case, um, then my preference would still be a fenestrated. I, I do like a good fenestrated where there's a good gra a grasp or a uh, gripping kind of nature to that instrument. So now this, we think it's all done, but this is the peritoneal pocket that we cannot miss. Um, although we cannot see any obvious endometriosis, like the typical blue, bluish or, you know, uh, reddish hemorrhagic spots that we usually find in endometriosis. Even though you don't find it, I would say this is still endometriosis, mainly because of that retraction kind of pocket that is created. Now, the pelvic side wall is not normal over here. In fact, it is puckered. It's formed that cone shape that I've spoken about earlier, although not as deep as the previous one. So that's, that's I think, a benefit. So this is a bit prolonged, apologies for that. Uh, but once we are done with this, you will um, actually see how we've gone ahead and excise the entire uh, 
peritoneal retraction pocket. So a bit of bleeding. I always try to get even the small bleeders. It keeps the entire field nice and clean. And once that's done, we go ahead and slowly start to excise the entire uh, pelvic side wall or the peritoneum. At times, so say if this is fertility sparing surgery, I would always try to use a bit of anti-adhesive over there because we do want to prevent the ovaries from um, coming and getting stuck to the pelvic side wall. So it's always worthwhile in investing in some sort of anti-adhesive over there so that the adhesions don't reform. Um, so we are going ahead and trying to de-roof this. Um, so trying to get to the bottom of that apex, making sure that the ureter is far away. That's the main thing over here. And of course, there are some important vessels that you will see in a minute how we um, carefully tease them out or um, dissect them off the attachment and it is a pleasure to do this over the um, robot i feel um, gives us great precision control and vision um, so i can see oh yes um, this is an artery and uh, with gentle movements i can tease it or coax it to uh, go away from the attachments of um, the peritoneum it, it's all about that right you you uh, visualize you engage with the tissue um, you almost coax it saying you know it's time it's time for you to come out or you know time to get excised so give up already okay when it doesn't give up i actually mentally talk to him saying why just give up you know your time has come so just give up already anyways here we are uh, almost towards the end so this is what i was talking about um, you can see that with gentle teasing um, you can move away the most important structures there's an artery over here as you can see as well but just gentle movements with your scissors and it all listens to you moves away nicely and once that's done you can actually go ahead and excise that's actually part of um, a branch of the uterine it's going straight to the uterus and uh, just above the uh, uterine uh, sorry the ureter so the water under the bridge appearance but nevertheless um, it's it's doable you can take the entire peritoneum you don't have to be too aggressive you just want to take the peritoneum and prevent any puckering or um, retraction spots that are there and you will see that once this is done um, there's just a little bit i'm a bit uh, finicky about um, getting all the peritoneum out uh, i could see that there's a little bit over the um, uh, ureter or the uterine um, so we're just going to take that out in a few seconds as you can see so once that's done i think the entire peritoneum has come and this is how it looks in the end so uh, once the specimen is taken out through the ports, we'll just show you a final picture. And um, then we've gone ahead and actually proceeded with the hysterectomy because this woman unfortunately also had adenomyosis. And this being Adenomyosis Awareness Month um, is a great uh, point to show that how often uh, adenomyosis and endometriosis coexist. So the final practical tips, be suspicious of any asymmetry. And if it does not transimulate or looks fibrotic, explore it. Uh, traction and you know probing the dimpling peritoneum always helps. Thank you. We'll be back with more.